Boeing's 747 family is arguably the most successful airplane program ever developed. Comprised of six distinct variants and 50 years worth of innovation, the program has managed to rack up over 1,500 orders to date. However, the newest and most advanced variant of the jet, the 747-8, hasn't pulled its weight, accounting for just 10% of all of these orders. But despite sluggish sales, building this jet was one of Boeing's shrewdest business decisions. How is that even possible? Let me explain. In order to understand why the 747-8 is a success, we're going to have to go over a fair bit of backstory, so bear with me for just a sec. At the turn of the century, Boeing and Airbus had crafted two very different views on what the future of aviation might look like. Boeing envisioned a future full of point-to-point -point travel between smaller cities, making connecting flights at major hubs less common. Doing so would decrease transit time for passengers and help alleviate congestion at airports. However, executing on this vision could only be done by way of a new, ultra-efficient mid-sized jet that could profitably connect cities that saw less demand. While Boeing was focused on building a smaller jet, Airbus was thinking big. Like, really big. At the time, analysts were projecting substantial growth in global aviation demand. This growth would be so fast, in fact, that the expansion of airports and related infrastructure would not be able to keep up. As such, Airbus executives surmised that the only way to satiate the increase in demand was by building a truly massive jet that could carry more than 500 passengers at a time. Both Boeing and Airbus reached their respective conclusions by doing extensive market research and competitive analysis, going so far as to interview customers and passengers to lock down a clear picture. However, it's important to note that Airbus wasn't completely impartial when coming to their conclusion. Behind the scenes, Airbus executives were undoubtedly influenced by what can only be described as airplane envy. You see, in the 80s and 90s, Airbus was very much playing catch-up to Boeing. While Airbus was certainly developing compelling aircraft of their own, including the likes of the A320 and A330, Boeing still dominated in the minds of both passengers and airlines, thanks in large part to the 747. Affectionately known as the Queen of the Skies, its massive size and iconic shape made it synonymous with commercial air travel. And frankly, Airbus had no iconic jet of its own to compete. In the process of constructing their vision of 21st century air travel, Airbus executives simply couldn't ignore the impact that the 747 had on the aviation industry. They became enamored with the idea that building a jet even larger than the 747 would serve to demonstrate Airbus's engineering prowess. Theoretically, such a plane would become as iconic in the 21st century as the 747 had been in the 20th, allowing Airbus to supplant Boeing as the world's premier jet maker in the eyes of the flying public. And Airbus wasn't exactly shy in expressing their desires to build a jet to rival the 747. Knowing this, Boeing engaged in what might be viewed as a shrewd diversionary play. It all started with a simple proposition. Boeing came to Airbus in the late 90s, suggesting that they could jointly engage in a study to look at the viability of new 21st century 747 replacements. In agreeing to do so, Airbus was teased with what could be. Their dream to build a super jumbo now felt much more real than it ever had. During the course of the study, there were clear warning signs that such a plane would not be viable. For instance, only two customers initially expressed interest, and in 1997, the Asian financial crisis darkened the sales outlook in one of the jet's key markets. Further, Boeing pulled out of the study before its conclusion. However, by this point, Airbus already seemed committed to move forward. And in late 2000, Airbus's board gave the green light to launch the A380 program. Meanwhile, Boeing began mobilizing massive amounts of resources towards developing the 787. 
This plane would be packed to the brim with groundbreaking technologies never before seen in commercial aviation. These innovations would ultimately allow it to become the efficient, mid-sized jet needed to capitalize on Boeing's vision of ubiquitous point-to-point -point travel. Okay, so what does this have to do with the poor selling 747-8? How does it factor into the equation? Well, in short, its existence forced Airbus to go all in on the A380, even when it became apparent that the A380 would fail. The 747-8 program was launched in 2005, the same year the A380 first began serving customers. In a universe where Boeing decided not to build this jet, the A380 would be completely uncontested in the jumbo jet market. Ultimately, any airline who wanted a massive plane would have just one choice, meaning Airbus wouldn't need to focus as much time or resources towards selling the jet. Such a scenario would present a problem for Boeing. Once it became clear that the mid-size 787 was the plane that airlines truly wanted, Airbus would have much more flexibility to redirect resources towards accelerating the development of a competitor. And this would end up cutting into the 787's sales. But by developing a competing jumbo in the 747-8, Boeing placed an obstacle in the A380's path towards profitability. Since shareholders were counting on the A380 to make back its substantial development costs, Airbus now had to focus all resources on the A380 to ensure that it didn't lose substantial market share to this plane. Now, Boeing probably knew that the 747-8 was never going to sell all that well. However, they were willing to bite the bullet because the jet cost so little to build, relatively speaking. Unlike the A380, which was designed from scratch, the 747-8 was heavily based on a pre-existing airframe. Save for new engines and wings, Boeing designers were already familiar working with its structure. Further, Boeing already had the infrastructure in place to build this plane, meaning they didn't need to spend a lot to establish a new supply chain or build a new factory. The result is that the 747-8 program only cost about $5 billion to develop. Comparatively, the A380 program cost over five times as much, at $28 billion inflation-adjusted dollars. Now, there's little doubt that Boeing made the right bet with the 787, as it's outsold the A380 7 to 1. And when you look at what Airbus is offering to compete with the 787 today, it appears that the implicit pressure campaign from the 747-8 was effective. It wasn't until 2018 that Airbus first delivered an A330neo, a full seven years after the first 787 was delivered. This jet covers the same 250 to 300 seat market segment as the 787. However, it lacks many of the advanced features that makes the 787 so efficient, including a carbon composite fuselage and wings. Between having its resources locked up in the A380 and the new A350 program meant to challenge the Boeing 777, Airbus simply was unable to make a more compelling 787 competitor. And the numbers show that to be true. To date, the A330neo has garnered just one-fifth the total orders of the 787. On a side note though, Airbus was still smart to build the A330neo, even though it couldn't match the 787's efficiency. To learn why, check out this video I did in the upper right. Okay, I know we went through this whole video talking a lot about the A380 and the 787, and not talking that much about the 747-8 itself. But that's kind of the point. The 747-8 has always been in the background of this dogfight between the A380 and 787, having an implicit, though not highly visible, impact on shaping how that fight played out to Boeing's benefit. But don't get me wrong, it's not like the 747-8 doesn't have strengths in its own right. We're still talking about the Queen here. While Airbus has announced that the A380 would cease production in 2021, the 747-8 actually still presents some sales upside for Boeing. While it's highly unlikely we'll ever see another order for the 747-8i, 
the passenger variant, it's entirely possible we see more orders for the 747-8F, the freighter variant. About 70% of all 747-8 orders to date are for that freighter variant, and it offers a unique value proposition. It is the largest modern cargo jet in operation today. When the Dash 8 freighter was first delivered, the global air cargo market was still reeling from the impacts of the 2009 financial crisis and really wasn't doing too hot. However, it has steadily rebounded. Considering the very first 747 was originally designed with cargo in mind, it would be fitting that the 747-8 continues to live on as a tremendous freighter plane. But really, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how many 747-8s are sold, freighter or otherwise. What ought to be remembered is this. The original 747 helped make Boeing the aircraft titan it is today, and its last variant, the Dash 8, played a key role in helping solidify Boeing's future. This plane is a great example of a company taking a short-term loss in order to reap a long-term gain. Wow, I know that was a really long video. For me, this video was really fun to make and to research, and it's one that I've wanted to do for quite some time now. Oh, and before you start complaining in the comments section, I wanna be clear that the 747-8 is not the only reason the A380 failed or the 787 succeeded. The success of an airplane program is dependent on a ton of different variables, this just happens to be one of those variables. What I would like to know though, is whether you guys prefer the 747 or the A380. So tell me about that in the comment section. And as always, if you learned something new today, leave a like please on this video because this one was hard to make and subscribe to keep learning. And until I see you again, don't forget to look up.